Our first scripture reading comes from 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 9 through 18. And in this reading, uh, Elijah has put to the sword the prophets of Baal and Jezebel, uh, the, the wife of the king, uh, Jezebel and her armies are out to get him, and Elijah is fleeing uh, for his life, where we pick up in 1 Kings 19, verse 9. At that place, Elijah came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael as king over Aram. Also, you shall appoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And you shall anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, of abel Mehola as prophet in your place. Whoever escapes from the sword of Hazael, Jehu shall kill. And whoever escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha shall kill. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Our second reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, and we're continuing pretty much in order through the gospel. Uh, we're in Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. Jesus walks on water. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came, walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. 
But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come out to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and, beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So this morning, both of our scripture readings seem to me to be very appropriate for the world in which we live today. Elijah is running for his life, waiting for God, and God promises to come to him, and there is a great wind that was splitting the mountains, Rocks breaking in pieces. Just imagine what that wind must have been like. But God was not in the wind. And there was an earthquake after that. I have to say I'm fortunate to not have experienced an earthquake. But my understanding is they are quite frightening. There is nowhere you can run. You're lucky to be able to stand on two feet in a strong one. At best, your best hope is to duck and cover. As the world shakes around us, God was not for Elijah in the earthquake. And then after the earthquake was a great fire. We know about fire here in Oregon, and God willing, we get through this summer without it. That is my hope and my prayer. But it wasn't just, what, two summers ago that every time we walked outside, we were hacking and coughing the whole summer away as we were covered with smoke. And we were the fortunate ones because all we had to deal with was the nasty smoke when there were whole communities south of us that were wiped off of the map, including Paradise, California. And there was a great fire. But God was not in the fire. The disciples find themselves in a boat after Jesus had done this wonderful miracle of feeding 5,000. He commands them into a boat and sends them off to the other side. And the boat was battered by the waves and far from land and the wind was against them. Friends, I don't know about you, but I feel like the disciples in the boat. 
I feel like Elijah hiding in the cave with earthquakes and tornadoes and fires and waves crashing all around us. I don't know about you, but I have completely given up on watching the news. Do not ask me what is going on because I really don't know. And I'm keeping that, w that way because I have to be able to somehow go to sleep at night. And just when I think the waves can't get any worse, or the fire get any bigger, or the earthquake get any stronger, it just seems to keep shaking and burning and blowing, doesn't it? We're in the midst of a pandemic that, God willing, will end up in the history books and children and great-grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren will tell the stories of what it was like. We are in the midst of social unrest that I at least can say in my short 42 years on this planet, there has not been in my lifetime. The storm is blowing around us. And I would dare say it's blowing in us too. Do you feel it? Do you feel that constant wave of anxiety that seems to just be permeating everything? Do you find yourself anxious and worried and afraid? You're not alone, believe me. I find myself talking to more than one person throughout the week, and I have to remind them, but you can't forget that these are extraordinary times, and we are all going through this mess together, and be merciful and gracious and kind to yourself and to others, because we're all in this boat together. The waves were against the disciples. And boy, does it feel like that now for us. This was actually the lectionary text for this morning, not one that I chose, but it is perfect that these two scripture readings are paired together for Elijah is hoping to hear a word from God, a word of hope. He has lost everything. He is running. He is fleeing for his life. And God, before this, God has shown up in big, mighty ways. Uh, imagine, imagine when Moses goes up, to the, uh, goes up the Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments and there's lightning and crashing and thunder and the Israelites are cowering down. You expect God, this is the same God, you would expect God to show up in a big mighty way that it wouldn't be unlike God to show up in a fire or to show up in a great windstorm or to show up in a great earthquake. But God shows up to Elijah in the sound of sheer silence. I like the King James translation. The King James says a still, small voice. It is so hard to hear the sound of silence. It is so hard to hear that still, small voice. When the wind is blowing around us, when the earth is shaking, when fires are burning, we have to be intentional to listen for that sound of silence. 
for that still small voice. We have to get away from the storm. Isn't it interesting that that's how God shows up to Elijah? And Jesus knew it. Jesus, after a very long and busy day of feeding 5,000 people, of teaching and healing the sick, remember that just before that he had been told that uh, his cousin and friend, John the Baptist, had been beheaded. And then he goes out and with the disciples feeds 5,000 and teaches and heals. And now it has been a long day and he sends his disciples out into a boat and he goes up a mountain by himself to pray. Getting away, shutting the door, tuning out from the storm, turning the earthquake off, and making time to listen for that still small voice is crucial. Joel and I were walking the other day at the middle school walking around the track, which is one of my favorite places in Cresswell to walk because you don't have to worry about tripping and falling. It's not hard to stay between the lines and you don't get lost because all you're making is left turns. It's kind of like NASCAR. <laughs> we were out there walking and I'm used to my own um, thing, and I'll go out there. Sometimes I'm talking on the phone. Sometimes I'm listening to music or listening to an audio book. Uh, or sometimes I'm just walking quietly, and I have this thing where I just walk and breathe, and that's all I do, and try really hard to just walk and breathe. And as long as I don't stop doing one of those things, I'm fine. So I brought Joel with me, and, well, he didn't have the same expectations for the walk. He wanted to talk, and we had a great talk for about 30 minutes. And then it got quiet, and it was obvious that he didn't know what to do with the quiet, so he kept talking. And God bless him. A lot of sounds came out of his mouth, but he said absolutely nothing. And I gave him a challenge. I said, what if we did the next lap and we didn't say absolutely anything? Let's try that and see what happens. We got five steps into that new lap when his phone came out. And he's tapping away on it. And I said, uh-uh. Nope. Put that back. Let's try five minutes of, or one lap of just walking and breathing. As soon as his phone was put away, he grabbed some keys out of his pocket and was twisting and jangling them. And I said, I'm going to start this lap all over again if you don't just walk and breathe. So we finally got one whole lap in. And I asked him, I said, there, was it that bad? And he said, yes, it was. <laughs> it was horrible. Because all I could do was think. And I didn't want to think. I wanted to be distracted. The problem with being distracted is we miss out on that still small voice. 
the problem with being distracted is we miss out on the one solution that is out there to all of the chaos around us. And that one solution is Jesus Christ himself. The disciples were far from, far from the land and the wind was against them. And early in the morning, Jesus came walking out to them on the sea. When they saw him, they were terrified, and they expected that it was some kind of spirit, some kind of ghost, and they cried out in fear. After all, this is what you would do if you saw someone walking on the water. Not an unreasonable expectation. But he calls out to them that still, small voice. He calls out to them, it is I, take heart, do not be afraid. It's not just about listening. It's not just about quieting our world around us so that we can hear that still small voice. It is about focusing our attention on God. Eyes, ears, and heart. Mind as well. You see, Peter, Peter in his boldness, I love Peter. Lord, if it is you, here's a test. If it is you, command me to come out to you on the water. And Jesus invited him to come. And Peter did it. He was out there walking on the water with Jesus, and he was just fine. He was doing it. He was doing the impossible until he turned his attention away. When he turned his attention from away from Jesus, he noticed the strong wind and he became frightened and he began to sink. Friends, we are out on the water. We are standing in the impossible. And if we're not going to sink, we have to keep our eyes our minds, our ears, our hearts focused on Jesus. If you are finding that the waves are crashing around you and causing you a great deal of anxiety, my challenge to you would be this. If you must watch the news or read the news to be to know what's going on in the world. If you must do that, I'm not going to say don't do it. If you must, spend twice as much time in prayer with God. Twice as much time as you do reading or watching the news. If you find yourself worrying, and you don't need to watch the news, but you're worrying about what is going on in the world around us. Go to a place where you can listen for that still small voice. Shut out the earthquake and the wind and the fire. Because friends, with Jesus, the greatest storm is only a tempest in a teapot. It may make lots of noise. It may shake the earth. It may threaten death and destruction. But it is not above God. 
For we follow the one who speaks peace to the waves, who commands the seas, and who loves us. So listen and watch and pay attention. Amen. Please join me in the affirmation of faith as is printed in the bulletin and comes from um, various uh, scripture readings. This is the good news that we have received in which we stand and by which we are saved if we hold it fast, that Christ died according to, for our sins, according to the scriptures that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, and that he appeared first to the women, then to Peter and to the twelve, and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus Christ is the first and the last, the beginning and the end, He is our Lord and our God. Amen. Dear friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. They will gather from north and south, east and west, and sit together at table in God's kingdom and share in God's love broken for all and God's love poured out for us. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took bread and broke it, and they recognized him. Their eyes were opened. And so in this meal, we break bread and we pour the cup and we recognize Christ amongst us. As we prepare to share in this meal together, let us come to God in thanksgiving and in prayer. Let us pray. Praise to you, O God, for all your works. You have created the world and called it good. You have made us in your image to live together in love. You have made covenant with us. And even when we turned from you, you remained ever faithful. Thank you, O God, for sending your Son He lived among us and told your story. He healed the sick and welcomed sinners. He shared our pain and died our death, then rose to new life that we might live and all creation be restored. Remembering your boundless love revealed to us in Jesus Christ, 
we break bread and share the cup, giving ourselves to you to live for him in joy and praise. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, and upon these your gifts of bread and fruit of the vine, that they may be for us the body and blood of Christ, and that we may be his body for the world. By your Spirit, unite us with Christ and with one another until we feast with him and all your saints in your eternal realm of justice and peace. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. After supper, Jesus gave thanks and broke bread, saying, This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The bread of life. After supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sin. Drink of it, all of you, and as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Abide in me, and I will abide in you, for apart from me, you can do nothing. Let us pray. O God of abundance, with this bread of life and cup of salvation, you have united us with Christ, making us one with all your people. Now send us forth in the power of your Spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Dear friends, as the storm blows around us, do not listen to it. As the earth shakes under our feet, go to that quiet place where you can listen for that still small voice, where you can watch and see the face of Christ. For there we find our hope and our salvation. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of God's Holy Spirit abide with all of us today, tomorrow, and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.